1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Using the Blue Man Group as my, <laughs> my phone from music. <laughs> uh, John Goodwin is on the phone. John is our friend. Hey, we've never met him. No. How many people can you say is your are your friend, right? And, uh-huh. and yet you never met him. I think in this in this business we probably have more than our share, right? We yeah. Have a lot of people we feel like our friends. Uh, we've had John on before in many different ways, and uh, one of the things we've learned about from John and from other people who have been published by Galaxy Press is the the amazing body of work that Galaxy Press is responsible for. Um, I think his office is on Hollywood Boulevard. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Uh, right down from the Chinese Theater. Is that Hollywood? I think. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, he's a member of the Science Fiction Writers of America, the Explorers Club, Mystery Writers of America. He's a board member of the Friends of the Hollywood Central Park, and he's a president of the Hollywood Christmas Parade Advisory Board, which we always pick his brain about that because we're, yeah. we're starstruck with people. Uh, the, the 10th anniversary of the Stories from the Golden Age is um, happening, right? It's happening right now? Yes. So they are re republishing, I think, uh, 80, 80 books containing 153 stories written by L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, we've learned so much about L. Ron Hubbard uh, in the years that we've had a relationship with John Goodwin. I, it might... Have we actually been... We had the... What was her name that came up to the studio? Um, Joni Siegel. Joni Siegel. Yeah. That's got to be 10 years ago. Yeah. So, okay. And uh, so let's say good morning to John. Well, hey, six John. Six years, maybe. John, good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good to be back. I'm from over here in Hollywood. Let me put your picture on here. I have a picture of you somewhere there. There's John. Good. Let me see what it is. Oh my gosh! It's the one with you with a, a scorpion coming out of your mouth. <laughs> oh, this is not a flattering. This is not a oh, flattering this is picture. Great. Oh my gosh! I can't remember what that was from. But anyway, so how you doing? This that is was, great. That was from the, an Explorers Club event that I recently went to. Nice. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. And, and here's another interesting fact for the listeners. John and, and Galen Unold from Life South met up in that, in Atlanta. Yeah, they did. During one of those th- Comic-Con things or Dragon, Dragon Con. One of those yeah. things, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So exactly. You, yeah. We, we became very good friends. Do you know Joni Siegel? Do you know Joni? I do. And uh, apparently she's uh, trying to figure out, um, maybe she's already started talking to you about it, redoing another uh, performance in the studio with you. Yeah, she and Robin have been uh, communicating back and forth, and they're making arrangements, and she's coming up when? Uh, Monday, July 16th at 10 o'clock. She'll be starting her one-hour yeah, special here. They're going to do a one-hour special radio play here. It's so cool. Do you know Do you know which title she's doing? Oh, that's a mi- I, I, I can't remember. It's a, a murder mystery, and I can't remember the title of the murder mystery. Hmm. Is it, well, one of them that they do is a comedic one called They Killed Him Dead. Oh, that's the it. murder mystery. Yeah, that's it. That's a hilarious one there. It's uh, One thing about Owen Hubbard, he was just, he took the various genres, and he kind of like went outside the mold so he could create his own thing on it. And this one here, oh, and another thing, too, about his stories, um, every now and then, as I republish these stories and sent them out to reviewers, say, oh, yeah, that's a blah, blah, blah plot, or that's the bleep, bleep, bleep. And I go... And when was the blah 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 written or the bleep bleep bleep? They go, oh yeah, that was oh that was written way back in 1964. <laughs> so, yeah, this was written in ni- this was written in 1942 or 1943, and they kind of go quiet. You know? Yeah, yeah. He changed he he changed the genre so much with the stories that he wrote. So this story here, they killed him dead, is just. It's hilarious. So, so you'll really enjoy that one. So uh, thinking outside the box, as he obviously did, was it difficult for him to get the stories published? Not at all. He was um. His problem was finding enough magazines to publish his stories in. And that's why he ended up getting 15 different pen names. Oh, my God. Oftentimes, oftentimes magazines would have multiple stories written by him with his own. And, you know, uh, Winchester Remington Colt was one of the, the pen names he used for his westerns. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Kurt, Kurt Von Rocken is, a, is one of his big science fiction ones. So he had all these different pen names that he'd write in. So you'd see a story by L. Ron Hubbard and then another name in there. And they're both L. Ron Hubbard because he was he would write 100,000 words a month. And he was publishing uh, a little over 90% 
of his work submitted, first submission, first draft. Wow. And um, so that was his composition speed, and he was an amazingly fast typist, so he was churning out 100,000 words a month, working three days a week, three hours a day, and that, that afforded him the time to do the rest of his researches and travels, which gave him the grist for his story mill that he was able to continue writing these these great stories. Wow, that is incredible if you think about that. So is it po if you used all those fake names, is it possible that there are some stories that got lost? Yes, it is. I've gotten, I've attended a few different uh, pulp conventions, which are uh, conventions of, that specialize in the stories written in the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I've had people that are like pros and say, okay, I, this was written by Hubbard, this was written by Hubbard. <clears throat> and because we only publish stuff, we only claim stuff that we actually have copies of the manuscripts on. Some of these things were, were lost. So if, if something were to be submitted to us, then we say, oh yeah, that was by Owen Hubbard. But right now, um, we just have to chalk it up to the fact that we couldn't find them, so we can't claim them because we can't be 100% positive so, that was that sounds his authorship. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's really wonderful, you just... Uh, are, you you just don't have these stories in audiobook form where you have one person reading it. You actually have a whole cast and a whole lineup of special effects. Yeah, that's that's almost like the um, the the whole eighty string of pearls or diamonds or whatever your favorite most uh, precious gem that you like to uh, to uh, to wear and to show off. Our audiobooks, they are they were done because we wanted to really emulate that whole time period with what we were doing. And so when you look at our books, they've got the, um, the rough edges that like the old Pulp Fiction books had, and it's got the same matte feeling to the, uh, to the covers. But with, at the same time period, the radio theater was the most popular form of entertainment in the United States, in America. And so that was where you had um, you know, your broadcast radio, which obviously you're very familiar with yourself, but you have three, four, five people in studio reading a, uh, a, a script or they were doing some type of a, of a show and you'd have somebody in there with a Foley, which is a box, a sandbox that they would then emulate the very various sounds of the man walking by putting shoes, yeah, you know, on yeah. it or well, yeah. all those different things. And so, but now we've got 150,000 plus sound effects we're able to use with our stories. And so with the 21st century sound technology and a half a dozen actors per story, we're able to raise that and elevate it to a level only seen in modern day uh, movie making, but with that whole yeah. uh, format of, of reader's theater it's just it, it's they're just wonderful. So, so when Joni was here last time, and I Robin's be, it's between six and ten it's years. About I'm not, six years. About six right, years. The ago. first year of the month. She actually. she actually brought up a bunch of the audio books, and uh, we we uh, listened to them one at a time. And uh, of course, it was way after her visit, so we couldn't comment a whole lot on the air. But for the listeners, these are some really amazingly done audio books. The one that you sent me, the uh, Battlefield Earth. Oh my gosh, that is a masterpiece right there. <laughs> That that is really yeah, and that's why I won the best honors. Yeah, yeah, that is a masterpiece. Um, you know what? I'm going to be the uh, the foley guy when when Johnny's here. I'm going to be the one pushing the buttons on the computer, right? That's right. You are. <laughs> you are. You're going to be doing just, all the sound I just, effects. I forgot the word foley. I just realized I'm going to be the foley guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going to be we fun. Need, we need to get a picture of that so you can see it. That's not put it on my on my Facebook page. <laughs> uh, he, L. L. Ron Hubbard, wrote a lot of different genres. I mean, gosh, he he was very very prolific, and he didn't just take one group of characters and then put them in a western town, put them in a detective town, or put them in a science fiction. Everybody has different personalities. <clears throat> yeah, one thing that was very special about what he did. Because he was one of the most traveled people in America there in the 40s and 50s, having gone to, um, he'd, he'd been to Asia three times by the time he was uh, tw 19 years old. Wow. So he actually, he had a sense of, of what people were and what they were like and their dialects and the whole thing. So when he, when he writes his stories, he could write with an incredible realism that um, other storytellers didn't have. And so you've got these um, these stories that people are like, wow, that sounds so so real. And a lot of times, also on recording these stories, we'd have 
um, because we were able to get so many actors involved with this, we'd have somebody from that country and saying, this is amazing. This is exactly how that person would talk. So, Oh, really? That real, yeah, so that was one thing that, was, that I didn't know until we actually recorded the audiobooks. Like the Scottish guys on, on Battlefield Earth. Oh, yeah, Scot- the dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> Remember the Scottish guys? They were great. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Tur- Turl? Was it Turl? Yes. I forget, mm-hmm. forget the guy's name. Yeah, that was some accent on that guy, right? I told... I, <laughs> yeah. We had him on the phone, too. Well, the thing- we had the actor on, on once. Yeah, we did. Turl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. Yeah, and the thing that was done to make just quickly on, on that with anything under science fiction stories, when you'd have aliens talking, we would take them and the uh, the sound effects were added to it, making it a little bit more synthetic, whereas the tones of the Earth people are all earthy tones. So it helps to make it easier to distinguish the uh, the aliens from the uh, from the Earthlings mm-hmm. on their actions and activities and when they're around, because then you can hear the, the subtle backgrounds that lets you know, like, oh, wow, this is this is an alien, or we're coming to an alien scene here because of the uh, the sound effects that were used. Since uh, L. Ron Hubbard wrote so much and traveled so much for his craft, was he a family man? Hmm. He was. Yeah. He he had his um he had his his uh, whole family, and the thing that he did though, because in 1950, when he wrote Dianetics. He commented, my life is no longer my own. Shortly after, people were just calling and, and following wherever to find out more information about Dianetics. So he later put in his in his uh, um, his own personal request that, you know, don't don't talk to my family, don't put my family in this sector because I want to keep them as best as possible, able to just carry on with their own life and not um, get pulled into... The, the wild world that he had entered now, having released Dianetics and then subsequently Scientology, because there was, he was traveling so much, he had so much stuff, he wanted to keep them able to have their own right, lives. Right. John, I have a question for you. Why is it the 10th anniversary? I, it seems like it should be a little bigger number. Well, we launched originally in 2008. <clears throat> so that's when we came out with Stories from the Golden Age. The stories themselves were originally written in the 30s and 40s and a few in the 50s. But we launched the whole program called Stories from the Golden Age in 2008, and being 2018, it's the 10th anniversary. Okay. And and these audiobooks that we that that Robin brought up were for the years they were doing. We had six years running that we had the audiobook of the year, or or the best the best of the year um, by Audiophile Magazine because of the quality of these stories. So we had year after year after year, one of our audiobooks was best of the year. By the audiobook industry itself. That's so, right. Wow. It's it's a 10th anniversary of celebrating the launch you, of the stories from the Golden Age. The technology has made it possible that we can now have the complete book on a little thumb drive or or, no, or whatever our phones. We can have it on our phones. And and I can remember as a kid uh, going to the to the vinyl record store. And, f- and finding some books, and they were all, of course, abridged. And so you didn't really have the yeah. whole book back in those days. So uh, did, did he attempt back in those days to put out records of some of his stories? Or, and, and if so, uh, I'm sure it's something you'd have to just speculate on because he's no longer with us. But uh, it's, it's got to be thrilling for his family anyway to know that the complete stories are also now available. Well, there were some of the stories that were... Um they were sold and made into like uh, TV episodes, and he had some um, uh, radio shows that were done of his of his works. Um, but mostly, he he stayed with the um, publishing of the stories themselves. The audiobooks didn't happen really until much later, and that started initially as a tool for to aid the uh, um, the blind or the visually impaired mm-hmm. to uh, to be able to enjoy a story. So when he so that wasn't really something that was so much when he was writing in the thirties and forties. Then, I mean, then you, you take a look at what a book sells right now. You know, the average, there was a million new books published a year in the United States, a million. Huh. The average book will sell about 250 when you average all of them, 250 books a year. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty much a, uh, um, it's, it's a whole new scene than it was back then. Yeah. But the pulp magazines, the pulp magazines, 
would sell between the, the top names would sell between ten and twenty million copies an issue. I mean, this was what it was. It's uh, totally amazing. If something is sold that much right now, a story right now, it's. Um, I mean, that's like Harry Potter, maybe. Sold yeah, that much, right, you know, right, uh, right. Yeah. One, one the, the, the Dianet, Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say one of the brilliant things that you guys do is is the uh, is the book we talk about all the time. It's the writers of the future um, uh, with with many many different writers contributing and illustrators and illustrators yes. and and there's yeah. all there's always uh, so, a sto- several stories from L. Ron Hubbard included in on that. So I, I think it's brilliant because it, it gives people who haven't been published an opportunity to to get their name out there, and it also introduces a new audience to the work of L. Ron Hubbard. That's right, and the ba- advantage of it is that, which is why he started the contest originally there, it was launched in 1983 after releasing Battlefield Earth, was to use the strength of his name to help pull, uh, pull up the, uh, the new names of the writers, so that's why it's Elwin Hubbard Presents Rise of the Future, because with his name, okay, I'll, I'll check this out, and so you've got these 12 new writers each year who um, are introduced, and it's... Um, it, it's been a, a total win-win on the science fiction fantasy industry. And then I know Emily's going to talk more about that, I guess, next week or whenever she's on speaking with you about it. And, um, yeah, that's just been amazing. We have entries now from 167 countries uh, that submit to it. And then just one thing she'll talk to you about is we just, we just had the youngest person ever as a finalist um, for Writers of the Future. So that was, that was pretty wow, amazing. Wow, wow. Yeah. So, do you have um, the the audio books in other languages as well? No, the audio books we have right now are well, there are they are in um, uh, we do have them translated, I think, for Saudi Arabia, but that that's it. Um, we have um, the five books translated right now in Spanish, but they're not audio books yet. We're working on a project to get now um, the main languages uh, translated. Um, and publishes audiobooks. Right now, it's just the, it's just the English. Is uh, Galaxy Press considering uh, producing a movie or a documentary about L. Ron Hubbard and his life and his contributions? Well, um, an actual fact is interesting to bring that up. There's there's a, a new TV uh, channel that just opened up. It's it's called Scientology TV, and it runs seven days a week, twenty four hours a day, and it's got amazing programming. And there's a whole section on. L. Ron Hubbard's life, and it has in his words as one of the sections on it. And so you've got these um, mini documentaries that have been created, but it's using L. Ron Hubbard's voice that narrates that section and talks about his, you know, like on writing his his, uh, his fiction stories. It talks about how he uh, would go out and live the stories he wrote. And so there's a whole section about that, um, which is which is great, and so people that are hearing his his voice a lot of times for the first time on TV, and that that's huge. It's um, I mean that's obviously because of the TV station it's it's set up in a fairing globally, um, but that's one people that you can go to, and that's just um, I think it's uh, channel three twenty um, that you can get on on um, Direct on Direct TV. But that's one thing that people can actually see there right now, and that's new programming coming up every week. Oh, so that's, that's wow. one thing. That's, now, I, I feel like I watched a documentary on the Writers of the Future dot com website, didn't I? Is there a documentary on him? Yeah. Yeah, I thought uh, so. Yeah. 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 Uh, but the thing that you so between both those things, the Writers of the Future dot com has that. Like I said, the Scientology TV has. It's not just. Um, I mean, the purpose of, of the channel is obviously just to, uh, not to proselytize and say, "Okay, here's." Here's the here's the facts of what you know, right, right. that you're otherwise not getting what you're otherwise not getting on uh, on regular news stations. This is the data, but it has other things on it now about just Ellen Hubbard and his life. So how do we help you celebrate? Do you have a cake? You want? Do you want me to send over some ice cream? Or anything? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I like Rocky Road. So you can send that my way. Oh, those are really good. I love <laughs> I, I love carrot cake. These things are Rocky Road and carrot cake, and I'll, I'll dedicate. The first five bites to both of you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's so funny. So, so, but the the big thing you're doing is you're re-releasing all the the 153 stories, correct? Correct. And so the thing about that, because you made a comment about the devices. Now we've got like the uh, the iPods, we've got uh, Kindles, we've got all these different devices that these things can be uploaded onto now. 
and personally can come to galaxypress.com to be able to get them. Okay. We've got, you've got obviously, you've got Barnes and Noble, you've got Amazon, all the places you normally buy books, you can find them there. But our excitement is that we just recently went to uh, the, uh, the National Library Show called American Library Association. And the librarians were so excited about it um, because these are age appropriate. They're good for, you know, they're high interest stories, but they don't get into immoral action. That's a really good point. Stories have. Yeah, that is a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And for for young readers, you know, we have right now this every every time there's a a campaign for the the local school board. One of the big things that comes up is the importance of reading. And then, it, then the, of course, the the question comes up. Well, what you know, what is what is actually appropriate for this age group to read? And you just hit on a, a whole gold mine of stories. Yeah, that's for sure. And one thing that came up, and maybe uh, after this show, we could I can uh, talk to you about, it, or when I get into the office, send you some information on it. One of the things that librarians were very excited about is we created a thing called a reader's theater performance kit. We took one of our stories and we we broke it down so that. A teacher or a librarian can take it and get and and do a performance with their students. You know, so the kids could actually perform an audiobook. We've got the script, we've got the parts, we've got the sound effects, and all they need is a boombox to be able to, to play the sound effects. It's just made very, very. It's not going to be nearly the, the the technical expertise needed for what you're going to be doing, but they can do it with like mono, with minimal equipment, that and cool. that's something the librarians that we we so went that. Uh, I just went to the website, uh, galaxypress.com, and I'm, I'm uh, kind of browsing through some of the titles right here. Um, is the artwork that I'm looking at, it was, is this the original artwork from the books when they first came out? It is. Wow. And so we got, we got, appro- we got approval to use that, and um, so it, that, that adds a lot because people just they get sucked into it, just like they did in the 30s and 40s. They get sucked into the, into the artwork because it is just so, so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the stories where he used a pen name, did you change it to L. Ron Hubbard so that it's not confusing? Well, what we put is in the back of the book, um, which you have to look at in hand, is we've got a picture of the original pulp, which shows the name that was used then. But uh, right now, for consistency's sake, on releasing the whole line, it's just the big on red letters on the top, L. Ron Hubbard. So when you line them all up next to each other, you just see the, the name of the story and then the... Um, and then the author's name on it, but we'll see if it was if it was a different uh, name that he used. We'll, we'll comment on that in in the back of the book. I lo- I love uh, I have this little speaker I bought for my car because I don't have a car that's Bluetooth enabled, so I got this little speaker I'm holding, uh-huh. it, and it's so cool because I can use my phone, go to the audio books, click the thing because you know the speakers on the phone are horrible, and I don't like earbuds. And it'll sound just beautiful. So I, for anybody who wants to have audio books in your car, if you have Bluetooth enabled, then Forget yeah. everything I just said. <laughs> but if you don't have it, I, I got this thing for $20. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, having Joni up. I'll, I'm, I'll tell her that we had this conversation today. And um, always good talking to you, Joan. It's great talking to you both. I very much appreciate being able to, to launch our celebration. We just, we've done two shows. Now this is the first radio show I've actually gone and said, Surprise! We're 10 years old. <laughs> Surprise, we're 10 years old. And, and you know, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, in addition to doing everything he did, also composed music. So I don't know if you ever going to... Does, does any of his music show up in the as the background music in the stories? Um, yes. In a book coming up, hopefully later on this year, called Mission Earth, a lot of the stuff that was written in there was... He actually, he actually scored. Wow, that's pretty impressive. I, I, one thing yeah. I wish I wish I could have had a chance to interview him. That would have been something. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been it would have been amazing. Yes. Uh, but the next, the next best thing is to tell people to get and listen to the audiobooks and read the books first in the Golden Age. They are amazing. They're great for readers of all ages, all the different genres: Western, mystery, adventure, science fiction, fantasy, a bit of romance. So it's something everybody can anybody can appreciate. They're short, so they're only like. You know, like a hundred, I mean, a couple hundred pages long, so anybody can get into it no, and enjoy awesome. the whole story arc without getting totally buried. Yes, and I can listen to it on my way to work, too. Uh, uh, John Goodwin, thank you for what you do and for being a friend and for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. You are welcome. We'll be right back. With 
graduate degree in management and leadership from Webster University, there will never be a better time for you to explore what's next in your career. Classes are scheduled so you can continue your normal workday routine. And the accelerated program means a new term starts about every 10 weeks. If you're looking to gain a broad general management and leadership perspective, then Webster University's management and leadership degree program is the right one for you. It's all a part of what's next at Webster University. Go to webster.edu slash manage. Accredited by ACBSP. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages. Fox News Radio, I'm Chris Foster. There's a vigil tonight for the five people killed in a shooting at the Capital Gazette newspaper in Annapolis, Maryland. The suspect, Jared Ramos, is charged with five counts of first-degree murder. He once sued the paper and kept up attacks on social media over an article about his harassment conviction. A former editor complained to the police about him a few years ago, and Chief Timothy Altamore tells Fox... I would love to see us, and in the near future, we are going to have the ability to start to follow up on individuals, even when we don't have a charge or even when we haven't encountered enough of a, a threat to, to commit them. At Cape Canaveral in Florida, we have ignition and liftoff. The Falcon 9 rocket powers the Dragon spacecraft toward the International Space Station. With supplies in the face of a robot named Simon to see if artificial intelligence can help with research procedures. Fox News. We report, you decide. When working at a growing business, you wear many hats. The new business hat the buying toner for the copy machine hat. The sifting through tons of resumes hat. You can throw away that last hat thanks to Indeed.com. When posting your job, Indeed lets you add screener questions that give you a less time-consuming route to your short list of qualified candidates. So go ahead, dust off that extra long lunch hat. Hiring's better when you've got your short list. Save time on hiring when you post a job on Indeed. Get started today at Indeed.com.